Fall of 2021 had found me in eastern Pennsylvania, exploring a handful of railroads I've had on my bucket list for years. After spending Thursday on the Delaware Lackawanna, and Friday chasing Redding and Northern freights through the anthracite region, I was all warmed up for Saturday's big show. Running round trip between Redding and Jim Thorpe, Baldwin Light Pacific No. 425 was set to traverse some of the most beautiful fall mountain scenery I could imagine. Pulled by America's loudest steam locomotive, this is the Redding, Blue Mountain and Northern's fall foliage steam excursion. I arrived in Port Clinton, Pennsylvania just after 7 a.m. on the morning of October 23rd. The Little Schoolkill River was drifting gently to the south, running alongside the steam shops of the RBMN, colloquially referred to as the Redding and Northern. I waited in anticipation for about 45 minutes until a headlight dramatically emerged from the plumage. I had been wanting to see the Light Pacific Type 462 steam locomotive for years and was left grinning from ear to ear as the gorgeous engine presented itself. Four twenty-five was deadheading tender first from Port Clinton to its awaiting excursion consist at the Reading Outer Station, which included the railroad's two fast freight SD50-2s, number 5019 and 5018. The big locomotives were a paint scheme very different from RNN's green and yellow look, designed for use on the railroad's trademark fast freight runs operating out of North Reading. The SD50s are of seaboard system heritage purchased from CSX in 2019 and running with an engineer today in order to assist 425 along the steep mainline grades. Four twenty five is a light Pacific class four six two type locomotive built by Baldwin in nineteen twenty eight for the Gulf Mobile and Northern, which eventually became the GM and O. The Light Pacific class differs from its Pacific counterparts in that, as the name suggests, they weigh less, designed for high speed passenger service. Painted in a striking GM and N inspired blue and white scheme, 425 is a mere drop in the historical bucket of the RBMN, whose motive power, rolling stock, and trackage have served under more than 30 railroads. Reading Outer Station sits on the southernmost point of the railroad's 300-mile-plus system, with the main line running north to Pittston by way of Port Clinton, Jim Thorpe, and the Lehigh Gorge State Park. A total of 10 branch lines splinter off the main, with trackage tracing its routes back to the Pennsylvania, Reading, Lehigh in New England, Lehigh Valley, Central of New Jersey, Conrail, and Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. The Reading and Northern is an incredible melting pot of fallen flags, with today's mainline venture taking us across tracks of the Reading and CNJ. About 20 minutes prior to departure, I moved a couple miles up the road and positioned myself in the farmland of Bern. Departure was 9 a.m. on the dot, and 425 was tearing through the countryside shortly thereafter. I was beaming. 425 is a sight to behold, dressed in a stunning coat of paint and equipped with an iconic Redding six-chime whistle. Gliding along behind the locomotives are 17 passenger cars, packed full of over 700 guests on today's sold-out run. The fall foliage trip was officially running as train OSJT, outer station to Jim Thorpe. 
It's not a straight shot, however. OSJT was to call on the Port Clinton station, which let me leapfrog the train to Molino. The quiet settlement is just up the road from Port Clinton, which allowed the rail fans a chance to see 425 laying it on thick in order to resume track speed. I was eating up everything about today's chase. In addition to 425, the beautiful fall colors were a first to me, and I'm always a fan of driving through the mountains. We had amassed quite the rail fan caravan, all in search of our next location within the small towns of the anthracite region. I had combed over maps for weeks leading up to my trip and felt pretty prepared, but it wouldn't quite be a real train chase if I didn't squeal in somewhere with seconds to spare. OSJT's blistering speed proved to be a little harder to keep up with than anticipated, but that's all part of the fun. From Hecla, I intended to beat the train to East Mahanoy Junction, or EMX, bypassing the scenic but congested town of Tamaqua. On the way to EMX, I wound up gaining some unforeseen distance on OSJT, and of course, took advantage. I'm glad I did, and really like how the train looked coming around the curve against the red tree backdrop. Even with an unscheduled roll-by, I managed to beat the train to East Mahanoy Junction. This is where the m and branch splits off the main line, which is climbing towards Hawks at a 1.9% gradient, giving four and a quarter a run for its money. The Light Pacific certainly lives up to its nickname, America's loudest steam locomotive. I thought it was just the coolest thing how 425's plumage blew so many leaves off the trees above. They looked really pretty falling alongside the burgundy passenger train. Up until this point, outpacing OSJT required ample distance in between spots. Luckily, the tables were about to turn in the rail fans' favor as track speed drops from 45 to 25 miles an hour north of EMX. This is due in part to the climb up towards Hawks, which takes the railroad around the mountain while there's a straight shot going street side. These fortunate circumstances allowed me to get well ahead of OSJT in a mere two mile drive and set up at Marion Avenue. Just like every other scene I had encountered, hometown was a pretty one. Maybe I was just in a great mood. By Marion Ave, the light Pacific was able to catch its breath a little, having successfully put the summit at Hawks behind itself.
Following hometown, the chase party accumulated at Tippett's Road, about eight miles up the line. When the chase had first gotten underway, I was a little intimidated by such a large group, but reassured throughout the morning by everybody's thoughtfulness and awareness. In the end, we were all here for the same thing, to make a fun day out of chasing the train through some beautiful landscapes. Suffice to say, I overachieved in both those departments. Reading and Northern had put 17 cars on the train today, with some of the nicest towards the bottom end. The Glen Onoko Falls, Lehigh Gorge Explorer Superdome, Mach Chunk Club Car, and the beautiful Black Diamond RBMN Car Number 1. Unfortunately for me, Tippett's Road was the last spot I would watch OSJT at. The Pacers through Nesca Honing had combined forces with Jim Thorpe traffic, spelling doom for the railfan caravan. Thorpe was a beehive of activity, with multiple trains coming and going, all while a town parade was taking place. I had never seen this much hubbub over the train before, but thought it was really neat that the general public is so appreciative of the railroad. That fascination didn't last too long though, as I soon found myself taking a 45 minute detour in order to circle back to the other side of town. I had been warned all morning to avoid Thorpe, but decided I knew better. I didn't. Thankfully, the excursion would lay over for three and a half hours, which I decided to spend in the Lehigh Gorge State Park. Reading and Northern owns and operates the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway, which was running 40-minute round trips out of Jim Thorpe and into the park. The train was departing on the hour with two GP38-2s, and I made it to Control Point River just as the noontime train was doing the same. Fall is a busy season for the RNN. The month of October sees dozens of LGSR trains accompanied by two fall foliage excursions on Saturday and Sunday each. Demand was so high that the Reading and Northern pressed two new rail cars into service almost immediately after arriving on the property, coming from the defunct San Luis and Rio Grande Railroad in Colorado. Control Point River, as the railroad calls it, is a super neat place. A bike trail snugs up to the RNN, where the new bridge splits off in the background. All of this soars over the Norfolk Southern Ashmore Secondary, which runs from Allentown to Hazleton and parallels the RNN through the gorge. With the scenic train well on its way, I decided to make my way to the other side of the Y for the remainder of the excursion's layover. This required parking on the side of the road and a brief hike through the forest and down the mountain. I always love finding locations to watch trains that are off the beaten path, especially when it comes with a view like this. The noon gorge train was making its way back into Jim Thorpe, crossing the Lehigh River shortly after my arrival. The mountainside provides a neat area to watch the scenic trains running in and out of Jim Thorpe. The fall foliage excursion is also spun on the Y in between LGSR movements in order to turn the train around for the trip back south. This deadhead maneuver is done so without the 425, which gets serviced and spun separately on Jim Thorpe's unpowered turntable. 
The railroad rents out a backhoe in order to spin the table, a backhoe which was reportedly running late on this date. Four and a quarter had to get turned somehow, meaning us rail fans were treated to an unexpected and rare sight of the Light Pacific spinning the Jim Thorpe Y solo. She sounded beautiful. Here I was thinking it was the heavy train that made 425 so loud, but watching the Baldwin run the Y unaccompanied was just as much a treat. Supplementing my pure joy was the gorgeous mountain scenery and fall colors. We were all very pleasantly surprised by our dumb luck, simply in the right place at the right time for such a neat, unscheduled maneuver. Business as usual quickly resumed as the 1 p.m. scenic train was backing into Thorpe at the reliable time of 38 minutes after departure. Spending a couple hours at Jim Thorpe Junction felt completely surreal to me. I'd seen numerous pictures and videos of this iconic location, and here I was, enjoying an afternoon of my own on the mountainside. The natural beauty of the area was more than enough to keep a smile on my face, complemented nicely by another gorge train. The engineer is taking it easy on the bridge over the Lehigh River, giving guests a chance to take in Mother Nature. As 425 followed the 1 p.m. train, the rest of its excursion consist did so with the 2 p.m. train. I was a little more prepared for this deadhead move in contrast to that of the Light Pacific, and got the drone airborne in order to watch the SD50s bathe in the limelight. Much like the rest of the railroad, the junction at Jim Thorpe has a lot of neat history. The Central Railroad of New Jersey ran its main line through town from the east, continuing on into hometown and Hawks. The deadhead passenger train is splitting off that very main line, now on a connection track built by Conrail off the CNJ. Conrail had done so in order to access the Lehigh Valley, which is now Norfolk Southern's Ashmore Secondary. The Conrail and Lehigh Valley joined up just beyond the rear of the excursion train, 
which has now evolved into NS owning the west track and RN the east track. Prior to 2020, the Jim Thorpe Y was non existent. It was simply the Conrail Connection track and the CNJ mainline, with no direct route from one end of the RN mainline to another. The newest addition to the scene here at Jim Thorpe is the Nesca Honing Bridge, completed by the Reading and Northern in February of 2020. The new bridge helps streamline operations between North Reading and Pittston and allows for easy spinning of its passenger trains in and out of Jim Thorpe. Fast freight service on a slow passenger deadhead. Trailing the two EMDs is an attractive passenger train with an eclectic history. Following the generator car number 1250 are nine lightweight standard coaches built for the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. Among the nine lightweights is the Lake Hato number 213, a relatively new addition to the fleet. Saving the best for last are two heavyweight Pullmans, one of which is off the SL and RG, the gorgeous Glenonoco Falls, massive Superdome, the Chunk Club Car, and the stunning Black Diamond built in 1889. To say I was happy is an understatement. I was thrilled to have seen the Scenic Railway, Excursion Deadhead, and 425, all with the green, orange, and red mountains in the background. Once all components of the Excursion train had been turned around, most rail fans left the scene to stake out their real estate in preparation for the return trip's 3.30 p.m. departure. I did the same, but not before one final Scenic train. It had been a fun couple of hours watching trains at Jim Thorpe Junction, and I was sad to say goodbye. All good things must come to an end, however, and thus I was back at Tippett's Pond, well ahead of the steam excursion and its accompanying fanfare. I was early enough to see RNN's other fall excursion, made up of two Bud RDCs, running round trip between Pottsville and Jim Thorpe as train JTPV. The rail diesel cars were a neat find, but nothing more than a warm-up for the return trip of 425. The main event was now running as train JTOS, nipping on the Pottsville train's heels and screaming towards Tippets in no time. Similar to the northbound run, there's a sizable climb back into hometown with the summit at Marion Avenue. This is a popular location among rail fans, but thankfully I had my own parking spot. Nobody else seemed to fancy parking in the mud. 
I had been pushing my set of wheels pretty hard throughout the day's chase, but not nearly as much as the crew of 425 had been doing, staring head on at the daunting hometown hill. I couldn't fathom how on earth the steam locomotive was expected to lug its heavy train uphill, but was not disappointed in the slightest. Light Pacific No. 425 truly is a magnificent machine. While everyone else had eyes for the head-on shot over the hill, my interest was piqued by the red tree and yellow ferns framing the track. This was one of my favorite scenes from the day, with 425's stack talk, the fall colors, and neat angle on the inside of the curve all coming together nicely. After tackling the hill, JTOS cruised downgrade so stealthily that it completely caught me off guard at State Road. I'm about half a mile railroad south of East Mahanoy Junction, from which I bypassed Tamakwa yet again and had exactly 14 seconds to spare at River Road south of Zenner's. This trip was special to me. I had been wanting to see the RBMN since childhood, and decided to pull the trigger once the railroad announced 425 would be steaming through the fall colors. The Baldwin was up front on six excursions during the month of October, a bittersweet event as the engine's FRA inspection closes in. One door closes and another opens, however, as the RNN is nearing completion of T1 number 2102, a massive Redding 484 steam locomotive. 2102 is similar to the 2124, a beautifully restored T1 sitting at Scranton's Steamtown National Park. It had been a treat to visit locations such as Steamtown and the Redding and Northern, a very fulfilling feeling given how long I've wanted to do so. Chasing the fall excursion was the climax of my trip, with scenes like Molino making my hair stand straight up. Coming in hot to the Port Clinton station stop. It was turning out to be a beautiful evening in the anthracite region, and Molino was the place to be. As JTOS prepared to offload passengers at Port Clinton, I was able to take a couple deep breaths and depart Molino at a relaxed pace. Good thing too, as the rail fan caravan had seriously overburdened the small town's traffic light. The fall foliage excursion was back underway around 5.35 p.m., and I had found a spot at Hamburg for one last run-by. This was yet another great showing, as 425 worked hard against the wet rails to get its heavy train back underway.
I couldn't have asked for a better chase of the fall foliage excursion and decided to wrap it up at Hamburg in order to get in a quick riverside hike prior to sunset. After my hike, I was looking for dinner in Reading and figured a swing by the station wouldn't hurt. I got lucky that the train was still on scene, which provided a neat opportunity to see 425 under the cover of night. From here, the SD50s will spin the entire train on the Y at Hawks, drop the steamer in Port Clinton, and return the northwards facing train to North Reading. This brought my incredible day with 425 to a close and left me just as I began the day, very happy. Thanks for rail fanning with me today. I hope you enjoyed chasing America's loudest steam locomotive as much as I did. <laughs>